Welcome, everybody, and all of you who have joined us for tonight's webinar on borderline personality disorder, how to apply the principles of mentalization-based therapy in your practice, and also to the viewers who are watching the recording further down the track. MHPN would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, seas, and waterways across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and you as participants are located. We wish to pay our respect to the elders past, present, and acknowledge the memories, traditions, culture, and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. My name's Steve Trumbull, and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. I'm a GP by training, but have been involved in medical education for many years and facilitating these webinars for MHPN for a number of years as well. I will introduce our panel. It's a bit of a different um, webinar tonight. You will have seen their biographies that went out with the invitation, so I won't go into them in detail. But this webinar tonight, we only have two panellists, both of whom are expert in the particular therapy we're discussing tonight. Normally, we review a case and talk about the implications of that from a multidisciplinary perspective. But tonight, we're particularly focusing on this concept of mentalisation as a therapy to assist people living with borderline personality disorder. Uh, the pair of experts are very carefully chosen. They already do know each other, but I'll introduce them to you. First of all is Dr. Julia Neshi, who is a clinical psychologist. And also Dr. Kathy Ludbrook, who's a psychiatrist. But first of all, Julian, to you, why are you passionate about working in this area of clinical practice? Well, Steve, um, I think what really... Uh gets me excited is, is actually working in a service where we can provide a treatment to people who might find it very difficult to access uh, treatment in the community for a whole range of reasons. People who have all kinds of complex difficulties and as a service, being able to provide that for people within the public realm uh, is something I'm really passionate about, the equity of access for, for complex difficulties. Fantastic. Well, that'll be of huge interest to our audience tonight, many of whom worry about access to the sort of services that you'll be talking about tonight. So great that this is something to assist them along that way. What about you, Kathy? What is it that makes you passionate about working in this area? Um, thanks, Steve. I've always been very interested in therapy. And so um, over many years have gravitated uh, towards seeing clients uh, with mental health issues uh, that are treated with therapy. Um, and more recently, about four years ago, um, I took up a position in the public mental health system. And what I'm passionate about uh, now is that we get to service what I see as a marginalised population um, with personality disorders. And I'm particularly passionate about bringing uh, people with personality disorders back into the mainstream of the mental health system because I think uh, within our system, uh, they there's been a tendency over many years to marginalize them great well it sounds like you're both coming from a very similar philosophy and i'm sure that's going to inform the conversation tonight we've got a bit of a luxury of time tonight to some extent so i'm sure we'll be able to get into some depth of conversation about how we can help this group of people and not marginalize the people who actually need to be very much supported within our community um i think you both work for, well, different organisations. Uh, Julian, you're with Spectrum, I believe, in, in Victoria. What can you tell us about Spectrum? Well, look, one of the uh, first things to say about Spectrum is we're what's called a, a statewide service, so meaning that we don't just target one particular part of the state. We actually receive referrals from all across the state of Victoria. And importantly, we're part of the public mental health system. Um, one of the things that people might be aware of, it'd be good to highlight about what Spectrum does is the range of activities. So importantly, relevant to tonight, we uh, provide treatment to people with personality disorder and complex trauma. And we, I can tell you a bit more about that if we like in the question time. So we provide treatment, we provide training to clinicians to upskill the workforce. And uh, I guess the other component of what Spectrum does, in addition to advocacy, is research in this realm as well. So there's a, there's a whole range of activities in this space of personality disorder that Spectrum does. Great, Julian, looking forward to hearing about that. And I see on the slide there, there's another logo, BPD Co. I haven't come across BPD Co. Kathy, can you tell us a bit about BPD Co? Yeah, sure. Um, BPD Co is short for uh, Borderline Personality Disorder Collaborative. 
which is a service that was established in South Australia five years ago. Um, and it has a lot of similarities uh, to Spectrum in that we provide um, specialised clinical services to people with personality disorders. Um, we're a hub-and-spoke model, and so uh, quite a bit of our resource also goes into training and capacity building across the system. And um, like Spectrum, we are fortunate enough to have a, a very solid research arm um, um, so that we can um, assess, uh, evaluate what we're providing. Um, so I think both of us work in pretty uh, exciting in services and uh, the only two personality disorder services besides, sorry, Project Air in New South Wales, but we're highly specialised and we're statewide as well. Okay, well, I'm very lucky to be in Victoria and hopefully you'll have something to share with those from other states as well. Um, I just need to, excuse me a moment, you two, I just do need to run through a few of the features of the platform to make sure people get full use from it. Uh, the first thing is to remind people that you can click the View Supporting Resources button, which is under the video panel, and that'll give you access to the slides, which our two presenters will be showing us in just a moment, as well as some resources that have been put together, and then the feedback survey, which is awfully important to us to know whether what's been presented tonight has been useful to you. Also very important, if you haven't done so already, go up to the top right-hand corner of your screen. You can see that little um, square speech bubble thing with stream chat written underneath it. Click on that to get into the chat room if you're not there already. Felicity Russo is there from Melbourne. She's just arrived. Rachel Conn, they're all, all arriving from Darwin. So get into the chat room and you should be able to then communicate with each other. Um, as well as with me, to keep our presenters focused. They can't see your chat, but I have the role of judiciously feeding your comments from the chat to the presenters. So um, it's a fabulous role that I thoroughly enjoy. For technical support, which unfortunately is sometimes needed, you can see there is um, the tech support button in the top right-hand corner of your screen. But the key thing is if the webinar is stopped, it's usually at your end, sadly, due to the uh, internet connection. So you need to refresh the browser. Just click on the URL line and it will reload and we should be back. And if you think you've missed anything in the time you've been away, the recording will be seamless so you can catch up on it then. Uh, so if you're not certain, reload and come back again. Um, if the webcast does stop at any time, do that. In the ground rules for the chat room, please be respectful of the other participants and the panellists. It is a public space there. And try and keep your comments on topic uh, rather than going off into other tangents about mental health uh, because it just distracts people from what's being discussed. Now, if we can move to the learning objectives, um, there they are. The uh, I won't go through in detail, but it is all focused on mentalisation-based therapy, which we're going to learn a lot about tonight. I do also want to point out, though, that what is being discussed is being discussed for educational purposes. This isn't a clinical consultation uh, for your clients or yourself. So the content in this webinar is for educational purposes only and does not constitute clinical advice. There will be some um, uh, triggering topics potentially. So if any content in the webinar does cause distress, please seek care with your GP, local mental health provider or service, or contact Lifeline 131114. So that's how the platform works. Hopefully it all will go okay. We can see that there are people from Broome to Adelaide uh, to Hobart, so we've got great coverage across the country. Let's now rip into the presentations. And uh, our two presenters have dovetailed what they're talking about. But we'll start with Julian. Over to you. All right. Thanks, Steve. And um, just picking up where you left off in terms of just to sort of set the scene about how we're going to do things here, I'm going to talk a little bit about the theory uh, and Kathy's going to talk a little bit more about the practice principles. And then perhaps in the question and answer session, we'll, we'll both weave that together um, as we go. Um, but the little bit of theory, I think, is important just to sort of set the scene and help you uh, understand where we're coming from when we're talking about principles and how you might apply them these sorts of things. Um, but to start off, um, obviously we're going to, here to talk about mentalization-based treatment. Many of you might be aware already, it's what we call an evidence-based treatment for borderline personality disorder. 
Now, in this context, what that really refers to is a treatment that's been trialed and it's, uh, in, it's the way it's typically been trialed is in, in a format where someone does the treatment for 18 months and they receive weekly individual sessions and group sessions. Now, to sort of bring it together about tonight, we recognise that many people in the audience might not be in a position to do an 18-month treatment. And the position we're coming from in this webinar is to actually talk about the key principles that underline this treatment, which uh, our view is that they can be applied in various different practice settings that you all might be working in, whether it's standard outpatient care, inpatient units, emergency departments. We feel that the, the key principles behind this treatment are readily usable and highly practical in all these different sorts of settings. And we can, we can talk more about that in the content and the questions. Um, and look, as you can see on the slide there, there's a whole range of evidence behind this. If any, anyone wants to dig into this in terms of the evidence base, there's some references down below, but I, I won't get too far into that tonight. Um, let's get into the next slide so we can actually talk about what mentalization actually is. One of the key things to start off uh, by flagging is that when we talk about mentalization, I'll get into that in a minute, but we're talking about a concept here that's actually central as part of being human. It's not something that's specific to people with borderline personality disorder. Mentalization is something that we all are born with the capacity to do, and it's actually a key skill that all of us need for social cooperation and understanding and smooth relationships, these sorts of things. It can sound like a bit of a mouthful, but I'm sure you'll recognize it in this definition. It's, it's the way our mind tells us what we're feeling and thinking and why we're behaving as we are. So it's about ourselves. And it's also about how our mind tells us how someone else is feeling and thinking and why they might be behaving as they are. So it's about self and other. And for most of us, most of the time, this, this meaning-making system that we use operates fairly automatically. We don't sort of go around our day sort of thinking about this stuff really explicitly. Usually it's when something doesn't really go to plan. Like, for example, we might do something without sort of really thinking it through, or we might be having a conversation and encounter a bit of a look at someone looking a bit puzzled at us. And it's in those moments that we, we sort of shift out of implicit or automatic mentalizing and really stop and explicitly think, hang on, what happened there? What, what made me do that? Or why is this person giving me a funny look? Where's that coming from? Have I said something a bit silly? These sorts of things. So it can be automatic and then we can shift to explicit mentalizing or thinking about things in a very sort of controlled way when we run into a bit of an obstacle at understanding something. It involves ourselves, it involves understanding others, it involves understanding our thoughts, understanding our feelings, putting both of those things together and using that to give us information about ourselves and what drives us, as well as imagine what might be driving other people to do what they, they're doing or appear as they are. And lastly, the other part of uh, mentalizing that's important to talk about is how we actually sort of read people, how we make meaning about where they're coming from. MBT says we do this in two main ways. We sort of might read someone from the outside. So, for example, we might look at their, uh, their posture, their body language, might listen to their tone of voice, their eye contact, and we might put that information together and use that to make a sort of an educated guess, if you like, about where someone's coming from. And the other thing we might do fairly automatically most of the time, I should add, is that we read people from the inside. We might take what we know about a person, uh, either from our relationship with them or with what they've said so far in the conversation. We might put ourselves in their shoes. And when we put all that information together, reading someone from the outside and the inside gives us, a, if you like, a three-dimensional or a nuanced view of where someone might be coming from. Now, the last thing to sort of say about mentalizing, again, is that it's a common human thing that we all need but we're also very prone to losing the capacity to mentalize. So when stress occurs for any of us, this isn't specific to people with borderline personality disorder, our capacity to think about these things I've talked about starts to wobble a bit. And by wobble, I mean it gets less flexible, less nuanced, this sort of thing. Okay, next slide, please. So why is this important? Well, I think I've already started to say in a way it's an important skill that we all need for social interaction, for cooperation, for relationships, really be making ourselves known to another person in a relationship, understanding where someone else is coming from in a relationship, these sorts of things. Now, mentalization is not just about others and getting along with others. It's actually central in forming various parts of our own experience. So, for example, we need to be able to mentalize ourselves, that is, understand our thoughts, our feelings, our values, our drives, yesterday, today, tomorrow. And we can put these things together, our motivations, our desires. It helps us 
form a building block of identity across time, a sense of who we are that's continuous as opposed to something that changes from, from where we are. Being able to understand what we're feeling, the, the sorts of emotions that are coming up for us, as well as the context in which the emotions are coming up, gives us a fantastic opportunity to be able to actually smoothly manage our, our you know, the ups and downs of our emotional life day to day, let alone it gives us a great advantage in being able to communicate more uh, readily with people about what we're feeling and what we might need from others. And if we can do that, it helps us navigate boundaries between ourselves and others and relationships and these sorts of things. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a, a brief slide, but it's a huge topic. And there's actually incredibly uh, long books written about this that are terrific and very interesting, but we're going to keep it quite brief for tonight's sake. I think the key points I'd like you to take from all this is that actually we're all born with the capacity to mentalize. Again, it's not central to people with borderline personality disorder, whether you can mentalize or not. We're all born with the capacity to do it. And MBT says that actually this, this ability to mentalize comes about, we think, in a relational way through the attachment relationship with our caregivers. And ideally, that's in the context of a secure attachment relationship, a relationship that helps us learn about our own mind and learn about relationships and that relationships can be the source of trustworthy and safe information to learn about yourself and the world around you. And MBT says that one of the important ingredients in an attachment relationship that helps mentalizing develop is this thing called contingent mark mirroring by the caregiver. Now, it's a bit of a mouthful. And what, what I'd rather you focus on is rather than the jargon around all this, is really this image on the right-hand side here. What we're talking about when we're talking about mirroring is really the importance of a caregiver Often enough, we don't need to do this perfectly, but often enough, picking up relatively accurately what the infant might be feeling and sort of understanding that as a caregiver, digesting that so it, it's sort of understandable and manageable and presenting that back to the infant. And we think that over and over time and time again, when this process happens like this, it helps an infant develop a psychological understanding of themselves, as well as an understanding that someone else can see them as a psychological being and at times have a different perspective to what the infant's having. So if you like, the, the attachment relationship is a central building block for the development of mentalization. Okay, next slide, please. To try and put the, the jargon aside for a moment um, and really talk to you about what does mentalization look like when it's going well? Well, I'm, I'm sure you'll all recognize terms that we've got on this slide here. So when, when it's going well, if we're mentalizing well about ourselves or others, it really means we're, we're, we've got an attitude of prevailing curiosity about what's going on for us. Why did I do that? Or where's this coming from? What do I feel like right now? Being curious about where someone else is coming from. We also might approach things with a degree of uncertainty. So we might think we have a bit of a sense of where someone's coming from, but we're open to learning from them in a conversation as to whether our understanding lines up with the information that's coming in towards us in a conversation. So we'll, we'll be able to take other people's perspectives. It doesn't mean that we have to agree with them, but we all, we'll be able to see where someone else is coming from and put that together with our own perspective, hopefully have some sort of workable interaction based on that. And as part of that, sometimes we, we come into a conversation or, or, uh, with a certain understanding about someone else. And as we talk and have a bit of a back and forth, a to and fro, new information comes to light. And when we're mentalizing well, uh, we allow our understandings of ourselves or others to be updated by new information. So there's some sort of level of nuance in understanding ourselves and other people. Now, all of this might seem fairly self-evident, but in, in contrast, when, when stress happens and our mentalizing ability begins to wobble, what it looks like when mentalizing wobbles is a, probably a little bit more clear, I think. So for all of us, um, as opposed to sort of slowing down and being able to think things through, things speed up when we're stressed and we lose the capacity to mentalize. We start to auto mentalize fairly kind of implicitly or automatically. Our curiosity can sometimes start to go off a bit of a cliff in terms of um, kind of how, how well it operates and we start to kind of get very sure we know exactly why someone might be thinking and feeling the way they are or we might be very sure we know exactly what we want about ourselves and our thinking kind of uh, gets quite rigid if you like or gets quite concrete either about ourselves or someone else and one of the things that can start to happen in that space is we can start to feel quite flooded by emotions we can kind of think less about our thoughts and feel like suddenly our emotions are 
upon us and we're flooded. We're suddenly going from zero to 100 and we're not quite sure what we're feeling or let alone where the feelings are coming from. And as the intensity of stress and increases and our capacity to mentalize wobbles more, this is where we can start to see at higher levels of stress and lower mentalization, a disconnection from emotion or an extreme levels of dissociation that might, might happen when mentalizing is not going so well. So let's move on to the next slide. We'll keep talking about what, these sorts of things. So to, to move from the general sense of mentalization and to talk more about how does it relate to borderline personality disorder. Well, as I said, it's not really a specific thing to BPD, but we think that people with BPD more easily lose the ability to mentalize under stress. And in particular, in, in a way, have a, a sensitivity to particular types of stress and the likelihood of losing this capacity to mentalize flexibly in the areas of relationship or interpersonal stress. And the thinking goes that they're more prone to losing mentalizing in, the, in these sorts of uh, sort of experiences and when they lose it they tend to lose it more quickly and it can take longer to regain that capacity to mentalize flexibly now when this happens mbt says when mentalizing wobbles in a significant way this is when we're prone to seeing the symptoms of borderline personality disorder so if the theory goes that a loss of mentalizing leads to the symptoms Perhaps to no one's great surprise, the, the main aim of MBT is to stabilize this capacity to mentalize and improve this skill so they can use it more readily in everyday life. And if we can do this, if we can improve this skill, then the symptoms that we see in borderline personality disorder tend to get better. And that's what the research shows, perhaps to no one's great surprise. So if we move to the next slide, we can keep, keep talking more specifically about this. Now, what you see here, there's a couple of things to talk about on this slide. First and foremost, there's not a, a correct side and an incorrect side here, but what you see is some of the, the things that I mentioned in my first uh, slide about mentalizing, these different parts to it. And what I've got highlighted here is, in a way, sort of a classic example of how someone with borderline personality disorder might uh, present in terms of losing their mentalizing. What might that actually look like if we take some of this theory and put it into sort of practice? Um, what might it look like? So under stress, what we might see is people mentalizing much more implicitly, which is a fancy way of saying automatically. So when that's happening, we might see someone thinking very impulsively, making very quick assumptions about either themselves or someone else's thoughts and feelings without really slowing down to clarify or test or to check out whether what they're thinking is accurate or not. As I mentioned, mentalizing is often about self or other, and we tend to see that under stress, a lot of people with BPD can become much more focused on others and, and in a way quite sensitive to other people's moods and what they might be saying and what that might mean for where they're coming from and their intentions. And rather than reading people from the inside, we tend to see a lot of people become very exterior focused. So what this means in a practical sense is someone might become very, very vigilant to reading people from the outside, their appearance, their posture, their body language, tone of voice, really become markers of evidence for their, the person's internal states and motivations. So in, in a way, I'll, I'll know what you're thinking by what you do, or in fact, what you don't do. The other thing we might see, as I mentioned, thoughts and feelings, we tend to see that under stress, quite in terms of a loss of mentalizing, it gets very hard for people with BPD to balance these two things together in such that they tend to feel like they're flooded with emotions that often feel like they're coming out of nowhere. So the emotions themselves might be hard to individually identify, let alone put them in a context. And in that context for people, it can feel like this is a catastrophic level of intense uh, emotional arousal that can feel intensely overwhelming. And this is, as I mentioned before, often in the context we see the symptoms of borderline personality disorder start to emerge where people uh, might get affected by this affective arousal and, and find different ways to manage that, the desperate sort of pain that they're in and trying to manage that the best, best they can. Uh, lastly, as I said before, it's not a right side and a wrong side, but when we're in mentalization-based treatment, what we're trying to do is not really sort of to get one people to the, the right side or the wrong side, but actually good mentalizing for all of us, I should say, involves all of us being able to move flexibly. And when we sort of get out of balance in a way that you see on a slide like this, good mentalizing be, involves being able to sort of bring both sides into it, to shift across, to be able to integrate both thoughts and feelings, self and other, these sorts of things. Um, so it's just a way of representing things. Let's move on to the next slide. 
Okay. And the last thing to say about mentalizing and stress is that uh, it can it can present in some more distinct ways that we'll just spend a moment talking about. Not not for theory for theory's sake here, but often these modes that I'll say a bit a little bit about can be important clinical markers of flags that mentalizing's dropped off in a particular way. And as clinicians, we might respond to that in a certain way. So when we're talking about these things that you can see on the slide called low mentalizing modes or pre-mentalizing modes. To tell you a bit about what that really represents is if we think about mentalizing as a skill, it, it, it sort of comes, it, it in a way represents the integration of various different sort of subcomponents. And the idea here is that when old vulnerabilities collide with new vulnerabilities and we're under stress, our capacity to mentalize in an integrated way drops off. And so these sort of early building blocks, which are these low mentalizing modes, these early building blocks on which mentalizing is built, start to sort of dominate for people in a particular state for a particular length of time. And really in showing you these slides here, I don't want you to get too distracted by the names on the left-hand column. They're, they're fancy jargony words that have an important meaning in developmental psychology, and there's big books on these sorts of things. But I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about sort of the right-hand column here, which is what all of us might readily identify either in the people that come to seek our help or in fact in ourselves as clinicians or as humans, because we too under stress can be prone to falling into these low mentalizing modes. So to talk through some examples here, when we're talking about things like psychic equivalent mode, if someone's in this mode, their sense really is that what's in their mind in that moment is with absolute certainty the way they think everyone else is operating. So for example, if I have the thought in my mind that someone out there doesn't like me, I feel like, like I'm absolutely utterly convinced when I'm in this mode. I'm absolutely intolerant of any other perspectives, any other information sort of bounces off and I be can become very certain either about someone else or in fact, if I have a view, for example, of myself as unlovable, if I'm in psychic equivalent mode, I, I experience that with the full conviction that I'm absolutely right and there's no other perspectives. So if you, if you like, you could think about it uh, a little bit like someone gets into tunnel vision mode around themselves or others and how they think about things. Teleological mode is a bit of a mouthful, but this really gets back to what I was mentioning before, where if someone's in this mode, they find it very difficult to sort of imagine someone from the inside. And in fact, internal states of mind are reduced to observable behaviors. So really uh, an example of that might be, I, I, I know where you're coming from or how you feel about me based purely on what you do or in fact, what you don't do. So for example, I might feel like you might not care enough about me if I'm one of your patients, if you don't extend my session time. It's a bit of a cliched example in some ways, but that's one example of it. Or similarly, I might get teleological about understanding myself. If I'm flooded with emotion that I don't, I don't understand or doesn't feel valid, I might feel that the only evidence I have that I've got a valid problem is to see that problem represented in the physical world. And this, for some people, can be where we see things like self-harm having a particular functioning to represent pain in a, in a way that feels valid and understandable to someone. And the last mode to just mention briefly is what we call pretend mode. Now, it, when someone's in this mode for a, a period of time, it's really they experience the mental world as being decoupled from the physical world. So how might we notice that in someone coming to see us? Well, it can manifest in various different ways, but one way is that someone might be stuck in sort of endless inconsequential uh, talk about thoughts without, without it really feeling connected to the emotions of what someone's talking about. It might not feel genuine or rich, or really the affect doesn't match up with the content of someone's thoughts. They appear to be disconnected from the emotion. And if you sort of think about this on a little bit of a continuum, you know, if someone's in a really sort of severe example of pretend mode, we might start to see symptoms of dissociation. So they might feel really cut off from the internal world, from the external world. And we can talk more about that later if we need to. Okay, next slide. I think we're on to you, Kathy. It looks like we are. So thank you so much indeed, Julian. I must say the... Uh, the feedback on your presentation has been excellent. People are feeling a lot better about themselves just by the quality of your voice. I don't know if you're doing that on purpose. Or it's just I mean, it's what the default setting, been, I'm afraid. Well, what you've what you've said's been fabulous. Just those reminders that uh, mentalization is all about being human, but what a fragile thread that is, uh, and how it disappears. So um, we're also seeing a few people have got their uh, systems locking up on them. That happens. Mine has here. Uh, but just keep on reloading people. Not that you can hear me say that, but if it does happen in future, just keep reloading and you'll be absolutely fine. 
But uh, I think you're quite right, Julian. The slides are now moving to Kathy's presentation. There you are. Over to you, Kathy. So um, if you can make sure your microphone's unmuted, I think yep. it is. Great. You're set to go. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to speak a little bit about the application of uh, mentalization within a therapy. Um, and I'm going to start with the therapist stance in MBT um, because they're really, there's a very characteristic stance to this sort of therapy. Um, so the important thing to note is the main focus is what is happening in the client's mind, not their behaviour. Um, you need to show genuine curiosity. And I think I don't think as a, a human being that's actually very difficult to do. You're curious about um, what's happening in their mind. You're curious about what's going on for you. You're curious about the interaction between the two of you, how you're affecting the other person, how are they affecting you. So you're modelling curiosity and you're encouraging it in your, in your client. You use active questioning because um, as... Uh, Julian mentioned you could think of mentalizing as a skill and as a skill it requires practice and this is what we do within an individual session and in a group session and the practice really is about encouraging the person to um, focus on a particular episode and break it down slowly and be asking questions to bring about their controlled mentalizing, their conscious mentalizing. So you'd be asking, um, what did you think uh, when they said that? How did that feel to you at that moment? So you'd be breaking it down to get them to actively mentalize. Uh, you would adopt a not knowing stance. And I'll talk about this um, a little bit more um, in the next slide. The important aspect of MBT and, in fact, all of the evidence-based therapies for BPD is the seeing the patient as an active agent in the therapy. They're not a passive recipient. Um, it's a collaboration between the two of you. Thank you. Next slide. Now, the not knowing stance is definitely not the same as having no knowledge. Um, but what it is an attempt to do is to capture the idea that mental states, what is going on in our mind, is opaque. We can never be 100% sure about what is going on in someone else's mind. Uh, we can work very hard to try and understand by asking questions, showing curiosity, feeding information back to them just to check whether we've got it right. And we can get pretty close, but we will never, we'll never know. And that's, that's very important because I think that in some of the therapies, there is a tendency to think that you know what's happening for the person. And that's definitely antithetical to uh, mentalization based therapy. Um, you've, you're um, taking up a position where you're attempting to demonstrate a willingness to find out about what is happening for your patient. What makes them tick? How do they feel? Um, what are they thinking? What impact does the uh, feelings and thinking have on their behavior? So that is your interest. And I don't think as a therapist, I find that a very easy thing to do as in people are just inherently interesting. Next slide, thank you. More about the therapist stance. Um, Inquire and challenge when the content makes no sense. Here, um, I think there can be a tendency, but and we try and stay away from this, um, there can be a tendency to actually fill in gaps when you don't quite understand what the other person is telling you about. You can think that perhaps you know, but it's important to stay focused on do you really understand what they're telling you. And if you don't, then you explicitly say when something's unclear, I'm, re look, I'm really sorry, but you lost me just a moment ago. Would you mind if we just go back and cover that again so I'm clear in my own mind what you're describing? Um, authenticity is important. Um, it's, a, it's a real relationship as well as a professional relationship, and that involves authenticity, being a human being. Um, and to that end, in MBT, we do make our mental processes available to the patient as long as it's 
in their best interests. So we've got to remember it has to be relevant to the treatment in the best interests of the um, person that we're seeing. But so you are. So you're open about, look, I'm, I'm a little bit confused here. Can we go back? Um, um, to be honest, I'm really quite anxious at the moment. Um, so you, are, you make it available uh, to the client. You're monitoring yourself. Um, so you're monitoring your own loss of mentalizing. Non-mentalizing begets non-mentalizing. If you've got a client in front of you that is really struggling to mentalize, uh, it tends to be contagious. So just be aware whether you've lost your own mentalizing. Remember that the person's mind doesn't work like yours. I think we can all fall into that uh, a trap, uh, not just in our work life, but in our social life. Um, they're two, two separate minds. So you're interested in how theirs is working. Um, you model own your own misunderstandings and trying to be curious and, and invite the client to work with you to understand that misunderstanding and try and clarify both perspectives. And don't take over mentalizing for the person. Um, I know in my experience, doctors love doing that. Um, so don't do it for them. Uh, what you're trying to do is prompt them to create a better understanding of themselves. You doing it for them is uh, not very therapeutic at all. Frustrating, but not therapeutic. Next slide, thank you. Okay. Um, the non, I call them non-mentalizing modes and Julian called them low mentalizing modes. It doesn't really matter, but the psyche equivalence, the uh, teleological um, mode and the pretend mode. Um, yes, they're sort of highfalutin names, but I personally I think they're actually very, very important uh, because they are uh, they're letting you know that the person has lost mentalizing. So there's something going on in that room that you need to attend to because your job is to try and get them mentalizing again, which usually means lowering the arousal in the room. Um, further on from that, um, so you monitor the arousal levels carefully in the room. And if you feel that there's too much arousal, the person's losing mentalizing, you actually um, slow down and you use empathic validation. Um, and I'll come to that in a moment, to try and decrease the arousal level in the room and allow the person the best chance to reinstate their mentalizing. If there's too little arousal, which can also happen, um, you've got to create more emotional closeness. And, and that's quite often done by uh, bringing the conversation into the room. Can you tell me um, how you're feeling at the moment talking about that? Uh, tends to bring it some more, um, increase the arousal in, in the room. Um, the sessions are focused, and we'll talk a bit about, more about that in a moment. Um, and I think this is really important that the interventions that are outlined in MBT are carefully matched to the mentalizing capacity of, of the client. And in my experience, it's very easy to overestimate the mentalizing capacity. And I'm happy to go into that more in the question time. I made a few notes from earlier. Um, so you have to match the interventions to where the client is at. And you need to spend some time working out the baseline mentalizing capacity of the person. And that's done in the assessment. Thank you. Next slide. Empathic validation, very important uh, in MBT. Um, Foundational, um, for the person to be open to learning from the therapy, they need to feel that their experience has been recognised by you. Um, you're not required to agree with the person. I like to think of it as, um, okay, I'm trying to get an understanding of what's going on in their mind. I'm asking active questions to create a picture in my mind about what's happening in their mind. And then I'm giving them a summary to see whether I've got it right. Um, and so for me, that's the process of empathic validation. So I just think to myself, do I understand what's going on for them as best as I can? Thank you. Next slide. Process in therapy. So we're just talking about a, um, a typical session in MBT therapy. 
um, you'd identify an episode that caused them some distress or difficulty um, during the week between appointments and you'd want it to be an episode that is relevant to the goals of therapy. So for an example, I had um, someone that um, we were working on their tendency to make assumptions about what is going on in another person's mind. So an episode would be discussed where they made assumptions about what someone else was um, thinking and feeling, and it, it led to some difficulties in the relationship. So what you do is you rewind back to that episode and you I think of it as micro-slicing. You slow it down. It can be sort of quite painstaking and you're getting them to mentalise in a controlled um purposeful fashion, feelings, thoughts, behaviour. So you're in a, almost a mechanical way, you're getting them to practice the mentalising skill to improve it. Um, you're trying to get them to reflect on their thoughts and feelings basically associated with that episode and the effect that they had on their behaviour. Um, once they can reflect on their own experience and because it's thought that mentalising self the person needs to be able to do that before mentalizing other. Um, so once you feel that they have uh, mentalized themselves in that particular episode, you would carefully, if you think they're up to it, uh, look at uh, the perspective from the other person. Um, so it depends where the person's at. Um, with regards to that and then you'll ask them about you know we're talking about it now do you have any other reflections about that episode that happened last Thursday um, to give an opportunity to reflect on that and then you would ask them how does it feel talking about it now so you're really looking at getting them to mentalize from every direction uh, to do with that episode uh, next uh, slide thank you I think that's the end of your slides, Kathy. But you did mention as you were speaking, you wanted to go back to spend a bit more time on something. And there's been some really good conversation in the chat room. A comment from Pauline Ogilvie. How do you assess the baseline mentalisation capacity? Was that what you were going to speak a bit more about, about how yeah. to find yeah. out where the person is and what their capacity for this yeah. is? Um, yeah, I'm happy to. I think one of the comments that um, I just made notes um, when Julian was speaking, is that um, I think sometimes we um, as assume that people have the building blocks of uh, mentalising. And by building blocks, I mean being able to identify how they feel, uh, label how they feel and communicate how they feel. Um, and many people that we see have some major difficulties in that area um, and so you can't expect someone to mentalise and be flexible within the poles if they haven't got these building blocks. Um, another building block is that I've been um, very interested in uh, the difficulties people have too of linking a feeling and a thought and a behaviour. And I must admit, I sort of, I guess I'd fallen into the trap of assuming that people have some capacity to do that. But I have been quite struck that some people find that incredibly difficult. And so if the person did have great difficulty in those areas, just getting an understanding of yourself and an understanding of yourself in relationships and an understanding of yourself in the world would be incredibly difficult. Um, so that's one comment just about um, building blocks. I'm happy to go into the assessment a bit unless uh, Julian wanted to add something there, but... Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, Steve, I can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Yeah, but, uh, did you want to contribute at this point? Yeah, I could do. I'll say something brief, but also uh, I think if you want to know more about any of these questions, bear in mind that one of the things that we, we do is actually provide training around these sorts of things where we can go into quite a lot of detail, if you like, about it. But mm -hmm. I think if you were to sort of take some of the ideas from tonight and sort of transpose them into a practical setting sort of tomorrow, one, one good way to sort of start to get a feel about someone's capacity to mentalise is really to, a bit like Kathy was talking about, sort of get them to sort of describe sort of a recent episode where something was difficult uh, for them 
And you might start to try and sort of ask about some of these concepts we've talked about tonight. Like, for mm-hmm. example, you know, when it was getting difficult for you, how easy was it for you to work out kind of what you were feeling or where that feeling was coming from? How aware were you of what was going through your head at the time? What were you thinking about other people at this point in time? How, you know, these sorts of things. Or, you know, how, how fast did your mind move at that point in time? How easy did you find it to slow down and sort of check out whether what you're thinking was kind of where that person was coming from? You might sort of start to ask these sorts of questions. And I think, you know, even if you sort of park any of the other terms we've talked about tonight, I think you'll quickly get a practical sort of sense of where some of the vulnerabilities someone might be having around these areas might lie. Great. Thanks to both of you. Now, I do want to remind people about how to ask questions um, using the buttons down the bottom there. There have been some really good questions coming up in the chat, but that is mere a fleeting bagatelle, and it goes as more and more messages push it up. So please do use the question box. If you hover your mouse, it's harder when you're on a mobile, I know, but if you hover your cursor over the bottom of the screen, those three dots, ask a question, Click on that and it will give you the form to ask a question, as you would probably expect. I have already made a promise to Bex Creasy that she gets first question because she was first cab off the rank. Um, And her question is, and both of you please tip in on this, she's wondering if pretend mode, as I think Julian outlined, might be a state that preludes or accompanies episodes of psychosis. Is that something that's seen? Well, there's probably lots of different ways of answering that. And, and Kathy, I'm interested in your take on this as well. Yeah. I mean, um, probably the first caveat I'll put around this, if, I think for the sake of tonight's sort of topic and audience, let's think about sort of the, the transient psychotic states you might see in people with borderline personality disorder because psychosis can is quite a broad term in and of itself. Um, so if we think about it from there as a starting point, I, I think to me the short answer is, both yes, but also it, it depends and be a bit careful. And I think it reminds me of one of Kathy's points, actually sort of parking sort of our knowing stance around this and being curious. But I think absolutely, yes, pretend mode can be a bit of a prelude to someone slipping into a psychotic state. But also some of these modes that I was talking about, they kind of sound like they're these unique, discrete things. And in a way, theoretically, they are. But quite commonly, someone might tumble quickly from one into another. So for example, if I start off in a position of psychic equivalence where I'm absolutely sure that what's I know exactly what's going on out there and what various things in my environment are meaning and telling me, I might start to become very overloaded very quickly and and, and my internal world might start to decouple from the external world and I might start to feel like I'm a bit detached or, as I said, in extreme forms, dissociated from things like that. So I think in that context, quite commonly, yes, pretend mode could be a prelude, but it might not be the only mode, if you see what I mean. There might be other parts to it. So it's important that we rewind, as Kathy was saying, from a not knowing position and really try and track forward and work out, hang on, what what were the sort of the precursors to someone's mentalizing, wobbling or slipping off in these sorts of ways? Kathy, I wonder if you've got anything you, you want to add to that. Um, I think it's um, not a clear cut answer. Um, I think that um, you certainly don't want to miss a, a, a true psychotic episode or a true psychotic illness, should I say, that um, needs to be treated with antipsychotics. Um, I think that um, there's some um, situations that you come across where it's very unclear whether uh, the person's psychotic symptoms are related to personality or um, a true, a um, primary, a psychotic illness. Um, I've so I, I do really think you've got to keep an open mind about it. And um, certainly I, I think a priority is making sure they're getting treatment for a, a primary psychotic illness if they've got it. But quite often you're left um, not quite uh, being convinced that they have a primary psychotic illness and you're left with thinking, okay, this is part of the personality disorder. And then I think you can formulate um, the symptom in terms of psych equivalence if they become very paranoid. Um, I think that they can feel very, they're in danger, fear. So I, I think that can be um, understood as psych equivalence. But I always think um, you need to hold on to humility and uh, always keep an open mind that you could be wrong there. Yeah. Thanks both for those comments. There have been a number of questions which are 
I guess, revolving around a theme about particular aspects of people with borderline personality disorders and maybe other conditions that might impact upon their capacity for mentalization. One that came in before the webinar was about noting that mentalization appears to require self-reflection, which is often a less developed skill in people with BPD. And we have a question from Charlotte Guthrie that came in uh, through the portal. Um, asking about how this form of therapy could be applied to a client who has both BPD and autistic spectrum disorder uh, and where both theory of mind and interoceptive awareness are impacted. Um, and these appear to be core components of MBT. And that also ties in with a few other questions about maybe people with intellectual disability. How do you go about modifying your approach to people that might have a different way of mentalising? Um, I'm happy to go. Uh, you can add, uh, Gillian, look, they're both um, hot topics in the mental health system. Um, the research suggests in um, when they look at people with um, a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, you're looking at about 4% that will have ASD. And if you look at an ASD population, about 4% will have BPD. So it's not a high, uh, com highly prevalent comorbidity. Having said that, what we're noticing and we've heard from other centres, and I'm not quite sure that Julian um, has, uh, his centres also uh, noticed this, is the people that we're seeing with the more um, severe and complex borderline personality disorder, um, it's not uncommon that they have ASD. So I think that it can certainly make the um, symptomatic presentations um, uh, more severe if you've got both BPD and ASD. In terms of theory of mind, um, I mean, I'm not, there has been some research, I believe, on in mentalizing in um, ASD, but I'm not quite sure of the results. But you sort of think that it, it's intuitive that if they if people can improve um, with in terms of people with ASD can improve um, in terms of their theory of mind, um, then MBT it would make sense to give it a go. Um, I have to say that um, we in our uh, experience of it's a very small n our experience of ASD and uh, um, BPD. I would have to say that. I don't think we've seen um, significant changes. Um, but Julian, your experience. Well, look, as you say, it's a hot topic and a, and a complex one. Um, look, a couple of things come to mind um, that's worth touching on just from a, a theoretical point of view where we might see both uh, people with either of these uh, disorders sort of having difficulties with mentalizing either themselves mm -hmm. or others. And, uh, you know, one of the things to bear in mind is that there sort of might be sort of different sort of pathways to those challenges of why someone might be having difficulties mentalizing from a developmental sort of point of view. H having said that, there was a paper that came out, I think, last year that showed a, a group trial with people with autism spectrum disorder, I think, uh, with, a, with comorbid BPD, um, and there were some improvements there. And I think my experience sort of practically when we, when we see a lot of people with neurodiverse presentations at Spectrum is that um, it, one of the things you said earlier, Kathy, we've just got to be really careful as clinicians, I think, as in particular to make sure we don't sort of assume uh, we know exactly what someone's capacity is for mentalizing. So sometimes when there's neurodiversity, like what we're talking about here, it, it can mean that we, sometimes we might need to be a little bit slower in terms of the rate of change we're expecting, these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, but I, my experience is I think the concepts are readily uh, usable for people and clinicians. It might seem like someone needs to be sort of um, very insight oriented uh, to use MBT. I think when you see MBT in practice, you can see, as Kathy talked about, it's it's really, if you like, a very frequent skills practice of this this uh, capacity to reflect. So even if someone's capacity to do this, whether it's they've got BPD or BPD plus ASD, if it's impacted, we we start low. We don't sort of try and meet them with very heady intellectual concepts and so, you know, insight, reflective comments. We try and really build the skill from where it's at, wherever the person's presenting with. So I think that's a really important principle to hold in mind, regardless of sort of diagnosis that someone might be presenting with. Thanks, Mo. So we've really been focusing on factors that might, either uh, through neurodivergence or other reasons, impact on a person's capacity. But what about motivation? There have been a number of 
questions about uh, engaging people who might be a little reluctant or avoidant to engage in this sort of therapy. Uh, Lisa, Heather, and a couple of questions before the webinar were asking about your approach to people who might resist or be disinclined to engage. How do you get people turned on to the therapy? Look, I think that, um, I mean, there's quite a bit of um, focus on creating a therapeutic relationship. And in my experience, um, the people that we have that are working in this area day in, day out, actually become very good at developing a, a therapeutic relationship. Um, so I think that that's the beginning point. Until you have some level of sort of rudimentary alliance, I don't think you can expect the person to be fully committed to it because they're not quite sure who they're committing with. Um, so I think some people where trust is a major um, a challenge for them, it's you end up going slowly and being patient and trying to build that trust and build their um, confidence in you as someone that is trustworthy. And that can take that can take a year. Um, in people that are severely traumatised, for example, that can take a year. We've had um, people where that's been the focus, developing a relationship for a long time before a more um, structured MBT could be embarked upon. So I think Erin might have anticipated that, uh, Cathy, and she's already asked what would be the most clinically appropriate method to adapt the core of mentalisation-based therapy into a short-term support model. So being very practical, when you've only got a limited number of sessions and you've got limited time, what are the, and we don't want to pull the eyes out of your approach, but yeah. what yeah, yeah, yeah. can feasibly be done in the practicalities of a short-term relationship? I think it's very, that's a very good question. She's um, on it. <laughs> that's a very good question. And uh, I'll give you my, you know, like, think about it for 15 seconds and, and uh, come up with it. Um, because I think that's a very practical question because certainly uh, there'd be many people in private that can um, have, say, 10 sessions. Look, I think that um, it needs to be focused. I think you'd want to uh, do um, some level assessment um, with the person. See, I'd be probably actually explaining to them psychoeducation about uh, mentalising, what it looks like when you lose it, um, can you think of uh, times when you lose it? And they might say, yes, I particularly get angry um, with my partner. That's what I want to work on. Okay, well, let's understand that in terms of mentalising and see whether we can pr improve your ability to mentalise for longer when you're feeling anger developing. So I think I'd be quite focused. Um, psychoeducation, then focus on a goal. That's what I would do. That's my, yeah. Julian, take it away. What are your thoughts, Julian? Sure. Well, look, look, I think you've done the heavy lifting there, but I think sort of also coming back to motivation. I mean, whether we're talking about motivation and, and a short window of time, like, for example, if you've got one session with someone, I mean, I think one of the things I wouldn't do is sort of come in and say, look, you need to work on your mentalizing straight away. I think whether we're working with someone for 18 months, um, 18 hours or 18 minutes, what, what tends to help with motivation as well as then where you go with things is really the person feeling like you can recognize their subjective experience of their, of their problems. And I think if you can do that without sort of necessarily using the language of mentalization to begin with, and so the person feels seen and recognized, they tend to be in that context more open to learning from you. And, and like Kathy said, I think motivation tends to start to flow if the person feels seen and recognized and then can link uh, what you're talking about um, in terms of mentalization, whether you're proactively kind of providing some education to their problems. And I think usually when people feel seen and recognized in that context, they tend to be open to trust and to open to going with you a little bit um, to work out, look, what can we do? If we understand your problems this way, how might we need to work on things, whether that's sort of in a, a brief period of time or a longer period of time with, with whatever model you're working on. I think what I, I wouldn't try and do is to try and sort of, in, if you're working with someone only for a very brief, just a one session interaction with someone, I think sometimes all of us can feel a bit compelled to get busy or to do, do lots. If I somehow skill up a person or talk at them or educate them lots, um, if I, because I've only got this window. I mean, sometimes that can be really important, but quite commonly 
people can walk away from an interaction like that feeling like actually hang on the person doesn't really get how things are for me so i think to sort of go back and summarize i would say slow down focus on helping the person to feel understood and i think if you get that bit right with empathic validation like kathy was talking about i think my, a lot of the motivational work is done but equally uh, and importantly i think you know whether you're in a longer term treatment or a shorter space of time if someone is sort of showing some ambivalence in terms of their motivation it's important to come alongside that and try and understand where that's coming from because often there's really important information and if someone feels like you can actually understand why they might be a bit reluctant for example to work out what they're feeling or where it's coming from and you know a common fear underneath that for people is if i start thinking about it then i'm going to start feeling it all at once and it will fly out of control if i talk to you about it you know, if, if you can open that up, then all of a sudden you've got a different pathway to help someone in that moment, to help them feel seen. And I think quite commonly that helps with motivation, these sorts of things. That um, coming alongside and being curious about what's going on for the person is such an important thread, yeah. as Kathy mentioned as well, uh, the concept of you know, not knowing but being curious about what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I cannot get through one of these webinars without redeploying the uh, the motto we were given by uh, a young woman with BPD who told us, don't get furious, get curious when things are, are going difficulty. And that's just been so useful in the past month since she, since she said that. And it's there again, it's come up tonight in the chat about being genuinely curious what's going on for people, but also being aware maybe that some of these therapies can be quite powerful. Question from Kerry um, asking about not triggering trauma. And this always comes up. It's really important. How can I best support someone with mentalizing without re-triggering trauma, given some of the overlap between BPD and chronic PTSD? Well, that's a great question. Um, shall I start, Kathy? Then. Yep, I'm happy to need to start, and I'll add. Yep. Yeah. Um, look, the, 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 there's probably lots to say, and I'll try and be be brief in in my own way about this. I mean, I think one of the the starting points for me is is recognizing that usually in a mental health setting, the the setting is inherently relational. And I think for a lot of people, when we're talking about trauma and complex trauma and BPD, quite often uh, an aspect of things that was traumatizing for them was relational. So quite often you're in this space where someone might be approaching the treatment setting in a way they already feel triggered. They might already be very vigilant to what you're doing or not doing, how you're appearing as a clinician, um, how you might respond to them based on past interactions they might have had uh, in their life and so on. Um, so I think we've got to be thoughtful about that. We've got to actually be aware of people's arousal levels and try and track that as we're going in the session to make sure we're sort of not charging ahead and, as you say, sort of triggering something. Equally, uh, we don't want to sort of avoid talking about things necessarily, but we want to make sure that we're monitoring someone's arousal level together with them so they feel like, actually, this, this clinician sees me, they recognise how I'm going, and I've got a sense of control about this. So these are some of the things I, I would sort of think about in terms of sort of basic principles, how you might approach this. It's already inherently sort of a risky sort of treatment setting, but be aware of arousal levels. I think some of the things we can actually do is also be quite pragmatic. You know, for example, Kathy talked about a clinician's mind being available and open to the person in treatment as a, as a source of information. I think sometimes if we're worried about triggering someone, it can be quite sort of pragmatic and practical to say, look, actually, some of the things you, you want to work on might be really hard to talk about. Can you let me know as we're going whether this is starting to feel a little too much? And then perhaps we can backtrack together and slow things down. So I would try and stay fairly pragmatic about it. I hope that helps. But Kathy, maybe you might have some thoughts on this one too. Um, I think certainly um, um, a fairly frequent comorbidity that we see. I, I think that um, it, trust is a major issue. I, I think, again, um, really probably reiterating what you said, Justin, uh, um, Julian, I mean, um, that the focus really is on developing a relationship and that may take quite some time. And developing a relationship is uh, being truly interested in that person's experiences and um, helping them to find a, a language to even describe their experiences. I think that um, I probably am one in terms of um, trauma um, got a psychodynamic background and I um, 
I think we need to be patient. I think the, in, the person inherently knows at some level the pace they can go. Um, and so I would really try and uh, mirror where the person is at uh, because I think uh, particularly with a complex um, severe trauma history, it, it can take a, a number of years um, before um, you actually or before they can find um, the language uh, to put it into words about their experiences. So I think you've got to be very patient and just painstakingly build that relationship and build some level of trust. And I do believe that um, the greater the trust uh, um, from attachment theory, um, the greater the trust, the greater the exploration. So as you find the trust builds within the relationship, the person will feel more um, able to explore their inner world, which will have the trauma. Um, I certainly, I don't, um, uh, I'm very respectful. I think that um, if someone isn't managing emotions and they're at risk of, of harming themselves or have been harming themselves, I would be very reticent to go into um, their trauma memories. So I would be um, staying away from them until I felt they had some capacity to manage emotions. So doing no harm is obviously, yeah. obviously very important. And there happened to be a couple of questions that came together on my dashboard, which caught my eye because they're both headed self-care and support for staff. Uh, one from Jennifer De Bruyne and one from Michael Nielsen. And obviously the other person in all of this who could be vulnerable is the, the clinician. I'm yeah. just wondering what your thoughts are about what sort of self-care opportunities there are for therapists, supervision maybe. Um, and um, particularly Michael mentioned staff in a, um, a care setting that might have experienced an emotional outburst from a BPD client and what mm. sort of um, supports there can be for clinicians who feel um, uh, personally um, affected by the work. Yeah. I think that um, uh, all of the evidence-based treatments for BPD um, have built into them uh, peer supervision. So I think having regular meetings with colleagues, a multi-D team, um, you might be a little team of a couple of people, but having that regular opportunity to discuss your experiences um, in a safe uh, setting, I think is very important. I think when that isn't available, certainly um, I, when I was um, I worked in private for many years, um, I, I um, was, when I struggled with one particular person in terms of my feelings of um, sort of distress how, about how unwell they were and how uh, their trauma history, I sought supervision myself, which was very helpful. Julian, any thoughts from you? Yeah, look, perhaps echoing Kathy's. I mean, um, maybe a, a metaphor that people might be familiar with is, uh, you know, the aeroplane one, which is, you know, sometimes we need to put on our, our own oxygen mask first before we're able to actually help others. And I think one of the things that um, I, I would really like to emphasize in this space is that actually normalize that as clinicians and as humans, we can find this work difficult for a whole range of reasons. And, um, you know, a, a point I probably made several times over earlier is that, you know, a, as humans, our capacity to think flexibly and nuanced uh, mm -hmm. takes a hit. Um, you know, when, when an outburst happens or something that someone might say or do in the treatment might, uh, you know, pu push buttons for us. And I, I think we need to normalise that. And so that actually we build a culture, whether it's, um, you know, within a service of being, people being able to speak and if different staff members have different views about what's happened, that actually we can all adopt this spirit of mentalising, which is, as Cathy said, no one, no one right, one person is sort of right, but actually it's about coming alongside each other sometimes as clinicians and colleagues to work out, hang on, why am I having this reaction? How come you're having this reaction? Let's try and look at this together so that we can sort of detoxify this sort of thing. And I think, you know, we can get external help for that. We can get supervision. Of course, I think that's a good thing to do. But um, whatever we can do to help prop up our own capacity to, to think flexibly uh, is going to be helpful in that regard. Great. We actually have a surfeit of questions, which is a lovely situation to be in, but we've probably only got time for one or maybe two more before each of you um, wrap up with your top top tips before people leave us, it looks like there are a few people who need to go somewhere. So we will finish at 8.30 um, Eastern States time. 
But I just was curious about this question from Nelson Clemente, which picks up on a couple that were asked before the webinar about the evidence or potential for combining MBT with other established forms of therapy. EMDR is the one that he's particularly mentioned there, uh, and particularly in addressing trauma-related emotional dysregulation. Do you pull in bits and pieces of other approaches, or do you try and keep your mentalization um, pure? Um, we have um, pretty much a sort of a one therapist um, guideline uh, where I work um, because we find that um, uh, boundaries can become quite a, um, problematic, I think, uh, in terms of who's doing what when you have two therapists. Um, EMDR, I'm very happy to be um, sort of corrected, but I guess my um, understanding of EMDR and looking at the training is that it's actually a therapy in itself. Um, and it can go over for a couple of years. And, and um, so I see it as a, as a separate therapy, I guess. I think so. I think it depends um, where we're working. We, we're trying to actually sort of stick to one of the therapies. But I have to say, um, in my uh, past life in private, I probably drew upon a few different ones at different times, depending on who I was seeing. Um, so I think probably the main thing is that you need a, a, a model, you need a formulation that makes sense to the client. I think it's very hard to have a formulation that involves several different theoretical models. So I think it's um, uh, more straightforward to have when it involves one theoretical model. Um, and they need to understand that formulation and it needs to make sense to them in terms of explaining the difficulties they have. Um, so uh, I guess for me, um, you know, trying to stick to one sort of modality largely is um, how I would go. And actually, Kathy, that takes me back to our previous discussion the other night when you were talking about the importance of everybody knowing their role in the team, the yep. interprofessional team is so mm -hmm. important, but people have got to understand, I'm the therapist, you're doing yep. this, you're doing that, you're looking after the social, whatever it might be. Yep. Uh, Absolutely, because there's often a number of people um, that are providing care for the person and we spend quite a bit of time um, defining roles and responsibilities before we start because, you know, the personality disorders are about difficulties with relationships. So we are going to be nudged into taking different roles within our team and outside our um, roles and responsibilities and we have to be clear in our own mind what are we doing and how can I pick up when I am actually uh, transgressing that a bit? Um, if you're not clear on your role and responsibility, you find yourself, I think, potentially in hot water doing things that weren't your role and responsibility. Well, my role and responsibility is the timekeeper tonight, so I'm going to move <laughs> us now to the final. That's known as a segue in the business of her. The final two minutes from each of you, just the key points you wanted to leave the audience with tonight. Julian, yours first. Sure. Well, look, look I, I think you had the line of the night with the don't get furious, say curious. I mean, I think, you know, if, if people were to take one word away from uh, this webinar, I think it's hard, hard pressed not to go with something like being curious. So, you know, it, it's, it's one of these things that I think as clinicians, it sounds like a very simple thing. We all kind of know it's important, but perhaps being curious about when we stop getting curious as clinicians and, and helping the people that come to see us, whether it's for a brief period of time or a longer period of time, be curious about their own internal experience and things like that. But uh, uh, perhaps another dot point I might leave people with is slow down. It's, it's so important in this world. We all know that validation is important, but really when we're working with people with complex difficulties, like we've been talking about tonight, as Kathy mentioned before, trust is such a complex thing to establish. So slow down, really make sure you take the time to make sure that person's subjective experience feels heard and recognized. That tends to open them up a little bit more to the kind of learning from you. And that's where you can start to think about, well, am I going to do a skill, whether it's within MBT or am I going to take a DBT sort of focus, these sorts of things. Um, so I think mentalizing is very compatible, but slow down first, be curious. Sounds like a pretty good recipe for life, Julian. Just making a note of that one. I'm going to get a tattoo tomorrow. Thank you very much. Kathy. your final two minutes. Yep. yep. Um, my uh, thought would be that um, to appreciate how much mentalising is a human experience, um, that it's something that we do, it's something that our clients do, 
And I think that um, it's a helpful skill, if we call it that, um, in everyday life. Um, I think that if you start reflecting on yourself and when you might be losing mentalising um, or mentalising yourself but not the other, um, I think it's quite um, – you notice – that you lose it yourself. And I think so in terms of self-improvement and self-awareness and other awareness, you can apply it to yourself. Um, so, and the other thing is um, that be interest in people. I, I think that we are the luckiest people in the world <laughs> to be able to see people and try and help people with these complex problems. And I think it's um, a privilege uh, to be, uh, have the license to actually focus on understanding other people and their experiences. It's a pretty good gig, isn't it? And thank you both. Yeah. It's been a privilege having time with you tonight. Um, you've given us an awful lot to think about, an awful lot to put into practice. So thank you very much indeed. Now, just a few things to finish off. Please don't leave us until you've done your feedback, uh, all you people. Um, I want to remind you that MHPN supports more than 300 networks where mental health practitioners meet online and in person to engage in free interdisciplinary networking of peer support and CPD. And tonight counts for CPD, as somebody was asking before. If you're interested in finding out more, please go to mhpn.org.au. There are upcoming webinars coming on working therapeutically with children who have experienced trauma from physical or sexual abuse. That's coming up Thursday the 19th next week, Partnership with Emerging Minds. Uh, another BPD one, I think it's the final in the series, Caring for the Carers, Wednesday the 9th of October. And then one of the ComCare um, uh, work-related illness one, the right time to return for work. Oh boy, I'm going to be at that one. Optimising work participation for patients or clients recovering from injury or illness, Monday the 14th of um, October. So uh, five weeks away. Don't forget the podcast series, Mental Health in Focus, which is in partnership with Anza Carter, coming soon. Uh, and uh, the old creative arts therapy, there you go, episode one, um, launches on Wednesday. So search MHPN Presents in your preferred podcast app. So thank you for participating. Don't forget the survey. Down the bottom there, the button below the video panel. Uh, will take you to complete feedback survey. So please do that and you can send your messages to our panellists tonight. Mind you, what has been coming up in the chat has been pretty reinforcing of the value of what's been said. Before I close, I would like to acknowledge the lived experience of people and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. So thank you to everyone, both online and uh, the presenters tonight for your participation this evening. Good night.